And thank you, um, everyone, for being here. And fingers crossed, everyone's energy levels are recovering from our beautiful full lunch. Uh, my name is Susan Luckman, and I'm from the University of South Australia. We are very proud to be supporters and active partners of the APO, and also very much involved in the current LEAF grant moving it forward. And one of the great challenges that we're facing at the moment is how technology is not just a disruptor of information flows, but has poses exciting challenges for the future and possibilities for how we can move forward. And it's to the possibilities that this panel now moves our discussion. So looking at some of the blue sky issues, we're starting to explore the issue of where to next for research infrastructures, and in particular to how we can make technology part of the solution and not just the problem. We have three wonderful speakers today, and as we've been doing all today, I'll introduce each person individually, and they'll speak for 15 minutes before we reconvene for some Q&A discussion. Our first speaker is Professor Julian Thomas. Julian is the Director for the Enabling Capability Platform for Social Change at RMIT University, where he's also Professor of Media and Communications. Please take it away, Julian. much um, and can everybody hear me clearly uh, look it's it's such a pleasure to be here it, 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 it's wonderful to to see uh, APO uh, flourishing and and the kinds of issues that, that uh, the, the the APO repository has 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 raised um, clearly attracting so much interest in speaking to to, to so many uh, topical and current issues uh, so yes, uh, you know it's a it's a real pleasure to be here to contribute. I hope to a conversation about future directions and future technologies. And I suppose my talk uh, will will approach this more from what I think is going on in the world of government, uh, and then get to how that uh, touches on uh, research repositories. Um, but it it it. Um, it's part of a, a, a fairly extended exercise I've been involved in in my role at RMIT over the last year or two, thinking about automated decision making and, and its social and economic and, and policy implications. And, and having been involved with APO for some time, it's always been in the back of my mind how the particular um, knowledge practices that that, that APO encourages and facilitates and enables uh, so well uh, might, might fit into this story. So th that's something I haven't resolved yet, but um, I, I, I suppose I think that it's possible to begin to see how that combination of terms, analysis and policy and observatory, might start to take on even more meaning than they have already, uh, and, and, and that's where my observations are really going. I also want to acknowledge my colleague at RMIT, Ellie Rennie, uh, who's been working on these issues with me, and, and really this talk, is, a, is, is it's got just my name on it for today, but uh, we've, we've raised these issues in other forums, and um, we, we're, we're pursuing this work together, both as, as part of RMIT's um, Digital Ethnography Research Centre uh, in the School of Media and Communication, and also working with our economics colleagues in the in, in the university's uh, Blockchain Innovation Hub. So, so that's the the, the the extended preface to this. I hope that gives you some context uh, for for what I, I want to say. Um, I, I think we can you know begin from this this problem of of, of, of trust and all the evidence that we see around declining trust in public institutions uh, and uh, policy making in Australia and elsewhere. Uh, and the, the, so, so we, we see trust and trustworthiness of, as having, having many dimensions uh, and uh, in relation to both the the public and the non-governmental, the university and other institutions of, of knowledge uh, that, that are involved in what we might describe aspirationally as, as the, you know, as, as 
as evidence-based decision making. We think we're, we're a very long way from knowing how or, or to what degree the new forms of automation that we see in government uh, might warrant, renew, uh, require or retain citizens' trust. Uh, so what I want to talk about is not whether the implementations of uh, new technologies such as artificial intelligence and, and, and blockchains uh, to achieve um, uh, whether, whether they inspire trust, but how they are beginning to be deployed um, to achieve governmental and economic objectives. And, and in, in, in this analysis, the significance of the new technologies is that they uh, create what we call cooperation without trust. Uh, and we think repositories like APO could be absolutely central to that task. So automated decision making involves a, an extraordinary con reconfiguration of, of government and administrative systems, uh, including systems of reasoning, data collection, calculation, exchange, interactions between agencies. Uh, and we know that there are very significant risks in all of that, risks that uh, for citizens. Uh, there are risks we know and many that we, we don't yet understand. But the kinds of things we've already seen happen in Australia uh, in cases such as, you know, the very well-known robo-debt example, where you had a very crude uh, system of data matching between two different government agencies collecting data for different reasons, and that data being used uh, for the wrong purpose. I think you know very clearly show uh, what kinds of uh, risks are involved and the, the the problems that we need to deal with. So today, I just want to sort of talk about two two of the high level technical developments: uh, the the emergence of various forms of AI, especially machine and, and deep learning, and and blockchains, which are those 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 distributed immutable ledgers. We, we know them very well from their use in cryptocurrencies. I'm not interested in cryptocurrencies, I'm interested in how they're used for, for other things, which is, which is really an, an area that's developing very, very rapidly. Now these sorts of technologies are often contrasted and seen as very, very different. Um, AI is often seen as a sort of centralising technology, which is all about bringing massive data sets together. Uh, blockchains are, are systems for um, um, are, are decentralised systems. Uh, a, AI is, AIs are often seen as predictive technologies, which are very much about thinking about what, what is going to happen on the basis of, of certain kinds of statistical analysis. Whereas blockchains build these um, massively redundant um, records, historical records of transactions. Um, but they also may embody code which determines future action. So that's one of the reasons why they're being used um, in government. Um, they're both deeply reliant on large data sets. So that's why, in particular, they're important to any, any discussion of, of, of repositories and evidence-based policy. Um, so all of the current practical uh, ethical concerns over big data, its quality and security arise uh, for both. And, they are, uh, uh, and they can be addressed in quite different ways. So I'm going to give you some examples. Um, but issues of transparency, accessibility, accountability are absolutely critical. So you have, and, and so, so there are kind of key issues with, with both uh, uh, AI systems in government and blockchain around data storage and structure and formats and so forth. Both of the, the, these forms of automation, despite those superficial differences, hold out the promise of increased precision and efficiency and the potential to remove or lower costs of intermediaries um, and in, in, in various ways. They, they come from different places, they've got in a way, they develop out of different kinds, different political cultures, but I think uh, 
in, in at least some of their applications and uses, uh, they're, they're converging. And in this slide, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of summarising why we think they, they, uh, they serve governmental ends, distinctively governmental ends, why they're so important for, for policy making and administration, and therefore, of course, why they're going to be important for applied researchers. So, so we think that, that, um, the, the, that these technologies uh, have the potential to formalise certain kinds of activities as well as decentralise them. Um, they, they make activities governable by making them visible. And one of the things they do, which is really interesting, I think, is they can speed up regulatory and compliance processes and functions, including policy evaluation. So I'll talk, to, talk a bit about, about those things. So uh, they do all that. They do that at, at a significant scale <coughs> and, uh, that, and, and speed that <coughs> enables new things to be done with data collections. Um, they enable, I think very importantly, coordination and connection between institutions uh, in, in ways that reflect not only the dis distribution, the fragmentation of data, but also the fragmentation of, of policy making and government activities in, 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 our, in, in our societies. Uh, and, and finally, I think they point to the emergence of new general purpose digital infrastructures, which, which do enable this, try to enable this idea of cooperation without trust. So just to work through a few examples, get the sort of so get a sense of what, what I'm talking about. So, the, the case of the Paradise Papers, which some of you might remember, this was a, a very large tranche of leaked documents relating to the taxation and other legal and financial details of large companies all around the world. Um, that uh, the 13.4 million uh, leaked files um, demonstrating how companies and individuals were avoiding taxation um, using complex transnational structures. So this is a source of data for government which is effectively new, completely outside the traditional sources of data collection which governments control uh, for the purposes of taxation or for anything else. And so the a it, so it's, a, it's a really interesting example because the ATO, of course, when this appears, all of a sudden, without any warning, needs to do something about it, but they are completely ill-equipped to do so. So what they do is build a you know, relatively simple system, but a completely new system that enables them to index this, this huge data set and unstructured data set and, and extract names and information. It's the kind of thing that, that you're starting to see happen and this, the sort of kind of thing that you see being in increasingly enabled by the technology I'm talking about. Um, Austrack is, is an agency that, that tracks uh, currency transactions uh, in and out of Australia. Um, it deals with, with reports from about 14,000 different agencies um, and has to bring all of that data together while protecting uh, the privacy of the, the individuals involved in those transactions. It has to undertake analysis of them in order to identify suspect transactions that may be illegal um, or criminal activity. Uh, and uh, so some colleagues of ours at RMIT in computer science worked with the tax office to develop some tools, some machine learning tools, to work through this massive data set while protecting the privacy of those transactions to identify patterns that indicated uh, further um, uh, analysis was, was needed. So they're the sorts of little tools you start to see emerging. Um, and What's interesting is when they start to turn into something larger, like an institution, like an infrastructure. And this is the idea of the Australian National Blockchain, which is a collaboration between a group of law firms and uh, Data61 and IBM, the technology 
provider. And the idea is that this is this is building something, what they call a, a connective digital tissue, a national connective digital tissue that enables uh, transactions across sectors, uh, right across uh, Australia and, and beyond. And, and, and if you look at the documentation around the national blockchain, it's very, it's very clearly driven by, by a kind of national vision. This is a sort of, you know, this is a kind of infrastructure that will follow. Uh, from um, the um, you know from, from our national broadband network, but structured in a very different way. By the way, it's not a public blockchain; it's a private one where they've got they want to have more control over who's involved in it. But it's structured in a in a very interesting way, really owned by its users uh, rather than by government or anyone else. There's a few more examples around around blockchain. Uh, which I, I, I could say more about, but I thought the one that I'd probably finish with, with because which brings us back to the questions of repositories, really, and what you do with the data that you have in, in, in APO in the future or elsewhere, is, is some work that I found on um, OEC, OECD data sets, uh, which is about how you can use blockchain technology to build not only an immutable record of, of data, of, of transactions, of, of the kinds of things we've seen already, but what people actually do with data. So if you're looking at some kind of policy decision, if you're looking at, at, at some kind of analysis or argument, what you want to see is not just the data set, you know, which the, which the standard open data kind of initiative argument would, would, would emphasise. Yes, you want to see the source data, but you also want to see what people have done with it, how they have analysed it, how they've used it, what sorts of linkages have they met, made between one data set and another, and what, what kinds of analytic steps have they taken to get to a conclusion. And, you know, so this is the enormous challenge around automation and and artificial intelligence, of course, that, that machines are making decisions, but we struggle to understand how they've made those decisions. We need to know how they've made those decisions because we need transparency and accountability, but we can't track that uh, and, 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 and we can't understand it. So, so the work of, of, of um, these scholars looking at how they could create uh, distributed uh, data sets, a, a, a blockchain using these, this, this, this OECD data, linking it with policy instruments, but also with the with analytic steps, which they call analytic artifacts, which live on the blockchain and cannot be changed. So this makes not only the data transparent, the source of the material, but also how a government agency has reached some kind of decision. And so it, it really struck me that that kind of idea is actually embedded in APO's name, an observatory where we can see what is happening, a, a, an analysis and policy database, because we, we want to know not just what the policies are, but how they've been ar arrived at. And so it's really interesting in this environment of declining public trust in institutions to see the emergence of these sort of tools or experiments, which are still at a very early stage, which start to attempt to document that. And, and in this way, to some, in some ways, they're, they're seeking to, to replicate and extend the kind of academic models of proof and reasoning that we've spent so much time trying to develop in the academy. So I, I hope that's a useful start to some of the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julia. Our next speaker, um, is, uh, speaking on a slightly different topic, our next speaker is Prue Mitchell. Uh, Prue is the Manager of Information Services at the Australian Council for Educational Research, ASA. And she has a background in teacher librarianship, global education, and ICT leadership. She's speaking today on Wikidata, Wikipedia, and integrated knowledge systems. Please welcome Prue. That's on. 
Right, lots of bits and pieces here. Listen, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak uh, on behalf today of uh, the fifth most visited website in the world, uh, proudly a not-for-profit website. And um, I'm speaking, uh, I suppose, in this uh, context as the president of Wikimedia Australia, which is the recognised chapter within Australia for the Wikimedia movement uh, globally. So it's my volunteer hat today. Um, I think you've probably all seen this. I'm going to assume a little bit of uh, Wikipedia literacy today. I, don't, I hope I don't have to say we're not related to WikiLeaks in any way, which is sometimes <laughs> something that we have to say. And I think Julian, actually trust hit me as you were talking. In the 17 years of Wikipedia um, and the movement, I think we've come from a very low level of trust to actually now being held up as one of the most transparent and trusted sources. Um, so, you know, that's correlated to other sources that traditionally we might have trusted um, either disappearing or um, being uh, influenced negatively. So what I'll do today in this 10 minutes is just give you an update on how the Wikimedia movement is looking to address this vision, which is, has not changed, it's still our vision, um, but heading to 2030, uh, there's a few um, things on the horizon. Two areas of focus specifically. The first is knowledge as equity. And um, the full statement, as a social movement, we will focus our efforts on the knowledge and communities that have been left out by structures of power and privilege. We will welcome people from every background to build strong and diverse communities. We will break down social, political and technical barriers, preventing people from accessing and contributing to free knowledge. So I think that fits the theme pretty well of, of today. And the second one I think is even better and it's probably the reason that, we're in, that I'm in this panel. Knowledge as a service kind of came out as a bit of a surprise when um, the process for the strategy planning had um, concluded. To serve our users, we will become a platform that serves open knowledge to the world across interfaces and communities. We will build tools for allies and partners to organise and exchange free knowledge beyond Wikipedia. Um, our infrastructure will enable us and others to collect and use different forms of free, trusted knowledge. And I think that's where we fit into data platform and connected knowledge. That's exactly uh, what we're looking at. So the way we've uh, done that, um, Wikipedia has definitely been successful in the, um, the last 17 years. 300 different language versions of Wikipedia, 5.7 million articles in the English encyclopedia, 132,000 active editors this month, and accessed by one billion devices, many of those mobile, in every month. And while as humans, people have processed encyclopedia um, quite happily and increased their knowledge, um, an encyclopedia is not necessarily the best container for all types of knowledge. And Thomas has already highlighted uh, the wiki journal response, um, answering a particular need in that area of research and academia. But neither encyclopedia nor journal article is um, an intelligent way for machines to process and consume, connect knowledge. And so Wikidata has been around for six years. How many people have heard of Wikidata? Oh, good, a few, thank you. Um, it really is starting to um, have an impact. It's a free, collaborative, multilingual secondary database. It collects the structured data um, to provide support for Wikipedia. So everything that's in Wikipedia is in Wikidata. Wikimedia Commons, which is the media um, repository for all of, of the um, projects and all the other wikis and projects within the Wikimedia movement. Uh, the easy way uh, I find to grasp this is in the old days when the census came out, all the volunteer editors had to go around to every article for every state, every city, every town, every country and update those um, population statistics, amongst other things. Um, 
And then they had to do it again for every language Wikipedia because Melbourne, for instance, is in practically all of those 300 Wikipedias. Um, that was really stretching the volunteer friendship and people you know, really thought there was better things to do with their time. The concept of Melbourne is the same, whether you're in French, German or whatever, the place and the um, population is the same. So by referencing the concept three, Q3141, which is Melbourne, um, I think you can see the potential of updating that. Also importing the census data in a structured format, thank you ABS, um, it means all of that can just flow through all of those wikis and, and update it. Um, the other, so that data and the content, just like Wikipedia, is shared and reused and distributed every day to hundreds of millions of users on third party platforms. So we don't care and we're not precious about those um, many, many millions of hits on Wikipedia. We want people to have the knowledge. If they're not coming to a web-based version of an encyclopedia, that then we'll go and find where they are. So when you use a search engine, I'm sure you've noticed the knowledge box on the right-hand column, which will try and give you answers to your question and provide information about your the person you're looking up or the organisation. If you look carefully, usually you'll see a link and that's coming from, that data is coming from Wikipedia or Wikidata. At the moment, there's 51 million data items and it's a cross-knowledge domain. So when you look at that bubble chart that you often see of the linked open data world, um, where the brown ones that, um, that are cross-domain. Um, that's just some of the domains that are included in there. You'll notice on the second to last line there, works, journals and publishers. And that's where I thought I'd um, just spend a little bit of time showing for, for you as a, um, an audience interested in repositories and uh, research. Uh, there's a project within uh, Wikidata called Wikisite. Um, awareness is pretty high that the most important part of Wikipedia is the reference list at the end of each article. So Wikipedia is uh, built on verifiable sources. That, you know, getting back to the trust and um, uh, the fact that you know, we're based on a, a, a tertiary, we're a tertiary source, um, we're not original research. And so all of those references actually weren't structured and um, so there was an extracting, uh, you know, that was a kind of one of those things that didn't happen early on. Um, but now there's a project to structure those references and it's extended now, people have got you know, very involved in this and are now harvesting citations of people who have cited those citations and building up the whole web around um, open citations. Um, and this is something, uh, there are other tools then being built on top of that. One of them is Scolia, which um, basically provides visualisations <laughs> based on individuals or institutional research history and the citation graph. Um, there's lots of missing data for Australia at the moment, but being Wikipedia and Wikidata, at no cost, you can go and add in the topics that you're interested in um, and the areas and institutions that you, um, that you need in there. Um, this has enabled quite a bit of uh, analysis and people in Wikipedia are always doing um, bibliometric type of analysis. Do you know what the most cited paper in Wikipedia was at this time last year? Anyone remember seeing that? It was actually a University of Melbourne paper. These guys, Peel, Finlayson and McMahon, over 2.8 million citations within the Wikime Wikimedia kind of suite to this one paper. And if you look at it, I think you can probably, you know, it was a climate, um, what's it on, um, climate classifications. So it was just, it was an open access, the chart was available, so everybody picked it up and used it. The authors had no idea, so we can go down a whole area there about impact, <laughs> but um, it's a great story to tell in, um, in Melbourne. Um, I'll just give you one example without going through. The, the, the Sparkle um, query interface for the, using Wikidata is very easy to use. There are lots of 
examples. Um, the one I like best is from Toby, Dr. Toby Hudson, a uh, chemistry academic at the University of Sydney. And so he used it to answer this question, is your publication record determined by your beauty? And he started by using something that looked at um, actors, their gender and their date of birth. So how old were they when they starred in the movie? So all of that, you probably know, anything to do with popular culture is pretty um, well uh, comprehensively uh, dealt with in, um, in the wiki. So I just have to hope that if I use this arrow, you'll get the first chart. All right, so you can see there, you can see that um, you're a lot younger as a female when you star, okay? But then he used that same, he modelled um, the same thing, looking at uh, academics, gender and date of birth and the publications that they aw um, authored. Do you want to have a guess what it looks like? Mm. <laughs> well, actually, okay, the problem there is not the age, it's the gender gap. <laughs> but, you know, that's the kind of thing. If you can think up a question, <laughs> then you can probably use Wikidata to, to get the answer. And that answer, once you construct the query, the answer will come back in um, seconds. So thanks to Toby for that. Um, the other thing I hope you all know, being Open Access Week, that everything to do with uh, the Wikimedia movement is open, open to all. Um, so uh, that's all very well, we say that, but do you know how many scientific articles cited in Wikipedia you can read before you hit a paywall? Okay, so we don't have a policy that says, we have a policy that says the facts in Wikipedia must be backed up by a verified source and we want the best quality um, research and evidence behind the statement. So we don't have um, even a preference statement that says it has to be an open um, access. Does anyone want to guess what the percentage? It's 29% open and then another um, I think there's another 10% that you can find a free to read version somewhere if you know how to look up for preprints and um, you want to go through thousands of institutional repositories or go to one of those um, things. So you won't be able to read that. But let me tell you, science is doing okay at the top there, if you can say 50% is okay. Um, and you get down to my area of education, that's fourth from the bottom. If you're in economics or mapping or media, you're below education. So, you know, we are nowhere near making everything available um, to everybody. And there's little projects, again, tools. The OA Bot is the tool of the week for Open Access Week, where you play a game on Wikipedia. It gives you a, um, a reference where the paywall, I think it's the unpaywall button, has found that there might be, it's identified that there might be an Open Access version out there and perhaps you could go and update the Wikipedia reference. Instead of putting the DOI, you could put the um, open access version. Oh, thank you, okay. <laughs> um, just another thing to note, all of that analysis is based on DOIs. So when we're talking grey literature and policy literature, most of it doesn't have a DOI. So, you know, we're behind the eight ball in the analysis. We're not even counted in that analysis. Um, open to where is the other question. So this is a map of all the Wikidata um, items with geolocation, and by no means does everything um, is everything coded. But you can see there's some pretty dark areas of the world in terms of us saying we are for all knowledge for all human beings, and so that's really a challenge. Um, there's another challenge that's not shown on that map, which is language. So if you only speak Khmer or um, Malagasy or some, some language um, that's not as well represented then, as English, then you're going to have an issue. Um, <clears throat> so the challenge really is to improve that map and um, we, my particular challenge is to try and do that in Australia. Um, you noticed Australia wasn't particularly good, we're probably okay down the bottom there and we know that there's probably not a lot of things in the middle of Australia, we're not expecting it to be the same all the way through. 
One very little easy way we do it is run a competition called Wiki Loves um, Monuments where we get all the state heritage lists in spreadsheet form, suck them into Wikidata, and so you can do that with any data set you own or that you need that's openly licensed. Um, get it into Wikidata, um, it gets set up as a property, it updates as that a data source updates, and then it's available to be linked to all the other things. We've got in there the ANZ research classifications, we've got lots of ABS data, we've got um, orchids, all kinds of things that might be, might be relevant and be ready to be matched, trove people, all those kind of data sets. So um, Wikimedia Australia, a really little plug here, so, uh, welcome your support. You can support uh, by editing, you can support by contributing data and content, by um, paying a small membership fee or just getting in touch with us if you want to, if you've got ideas on a project to improve things. Okay. Thank you so much, Prue, and your presentation is absolutely a wonderful example of powerful impact of images to communicate information as well, which brings us to our next speaker very smoothly. Um, our next speaker <laughs> is Amir Ayani, and Amir is head of the Social Data Analytics Lab in, in the Social Innovation Research Institute at Swinburne University of Technology here in Melbourne. I think there's a little bit of technical uh, stuff that needs to go on here, but just quickly, um, the presentation is entitled Connecting Systems and Visualising Networks, and I think we're going to get a live example of this. So thank you very much, Amir. I probably I'm the only one here doing the live presentation. Let's see how the technology works for us. Good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, the topic of this talk has changed almost uh, four times from yesterday. So <laughs> this is the latest version, and I was actually editing this on the back uh, for a number of different reasons. One is that I realized a lot of visualization I had actually doesn't work for the people on the back because of the, uh, the color contrast. And also, I was trying to put some of the other feedback from all the other different ideas that goes into the forum today as part of this. So now the title has edited. Now we have connecting scholarly systems and visualizing collaboration networks. A little bit of extension. <laughs> so uh, okay. So let me start by saying uh, we all know that the research is a collaborative enterprise. That's simple. Given everyone knows that, uh, the question is to what extent? How much is it collaborative? Um, one question I have here for everyone. Do you, anyone here has any idea that how many p uh, papers in Australia has been published with collaboration of people in China? Let me make it simple. Is it the case that more than how much of our paper published with collaboration with overseas partners? Give me a person between 0% uh, to 100% if you think that, for example, more than 20% of Australian research has an international collaboration attached to it? 20%. Okay, so and I also had a 50%. Let's go see the answer. So this is the uh, map of the world based on the collaboration of Australian research when a paper actually has a co-authors from different organizations. So obviously, Australia goes very much green because that is the point of the whole collaboration. And the greener it is, that means the more collaboration we have. Now, I know that for the people on the back, that may not be very much visible. But United States is very much green. So that's one of our top partners in collaboration. And then if we go further into Europe, we will see the United Kingdom and Germany are the top partners in that field. Uh, this was the work that we did last week with, uh, with the collaboration of Australian Access Federation and ORCID and Research Graph. So everyone puts their data together. And it uses a very hybrid database that has almost most of those Australian research into that corpus. Um, 
Now, one of the other things that came out was China. I knew that, that China has a lot of collaboration with Australia, but I didn't know that how much. In fact, a number of uh, Chinese universities and research institutions who work with Australian universities is actually more than US and UK, according to our data. That might be wrong. <laughs> but the, the, based on the data set that we have, when we look at the number of institutions who work with Australia, China actually is in the uh, top three levels. Now, this is another thing that's called flight map. Again, I'm sure probably it will be hard to see from the back. And that shows the University of uh, Swinburne University as a point of flying out to all different countries. And basically, each line represents one collaboration point. Uh, we can look at the same thing going zoom into Europe. But the interesting point would be the same thing with the University of Melbourne. So that's why I picked the information from different speakers. So the University of Melbourne, we see much more flying out to different countries as a point of collaboration. Now, everything that I showed, you can actually access it using the platform that's called Tabloid. And some of this actually is already public. So actually talking about open data. Um, there is another chart that, again, I don't know how visible it is. This is the list of all different uh, collaboration points around the globe. And when we filter this by different universities, we can see the, how the lights goes on and off based on the number of collaboration. So when we go, for example, to something like University of Melbourne, we saw the lights goes up. And then we go to a smaller university, this pattern actually changes. So speaking about a power of data, this information per se doesn't actually mean anything, uh, except to the people who do the research in the bibliographic records. But what it does mean is actually the point that we make a decision about our open access policies and collaboration points in general. If we go to um, more analytical statistics, actually, that's another fancy graph. Let me go to this and I'll get to the message. So this is, this is not a star system. This is actually the collaboration system. And we are on that corner. Uh, this is uh, basically a list of all the collaboration in Australia by different countries. Uh, and we can actually zoom into universe, uh, Swinburne in that context. Uh, and we see that all based on the countries, how they are actually linked to us. The slide I was going to get to this is this one, about the question that I asked. So in the last 10 years, again, based on our data, that may, may or may not be complete, uh, between two Australian university collaboration, if you go by the pairwise, we have 955,000 plus papers. If you go for uh, US, uh, China, and United Kingdom, we have more than 990,000 papers. So already, we are more than, uh, we're more than 100%. So we actually collaborate more with those three countries than just between ourselves in Australia. And, uh, and if we look at this whole, actually it was 966,000. And with the rest of the world, is 990,000. So if you think about this, we actually collaborate two times more with international collaborators compared to the collaborations in Australia. So now, all of these are at the international and national level, collaboration between universities. What can it mean or does it mean for the repositories? Uh, Again, based on the same data set, we know about uh, 250 million scholarly works across the globe, open access and published records. Some of this comes from the uh, uh, common sources, like Elsevier's and uh, Clarence, but some of this also comes from the core open access repository, which has all open access data into it. Uh, so you know, we are almost having the data tsunami in a way. And if you are in business, you might do this. Uh, there's a way of taking advantage from that. But also, if you are in academia, you might also think about how I can leverage access to all of this data. So this is a page of APO. And one of the things that Les and I we were working on is previously looking at how to actually improve the discoverability in APO. And we have an article here uh, from uh, Tricia Greenhold. And uh, we don't know anything else about that researcher. Now, we know later on, we learn, as part of the, another work, that that researcher has an ORCID profile. If you go to that ORCID profile, we can find all other related publications. And uh, those publications from other sources have links to other things. So I just here I gave one example. 
uh, connections from Scholex, which is another uh, international activity for connecting the publications to data sets. And here we can, for example, find the link between the data publications. So we can here build a chain of collaboration across these sources. Uh, we went to a pilot project around this, and we basically grabbed the APO's data. We did all of these events, activities to find the links. And I don't go the technical aspect of this, but what I can tell you is that when we went to the exercise, we found that we can actually find another, uh, well, we can increase this from 25,000 to 44,000 publications in APO. So APO, without this process, has a record of 24,000 articles. And when we go through this process, we will find about another uh, 20,000 uh, articles that we can actually link to the same space. So again, going back to the graphs, this is how it's going to look like before and after this augmentation. So we have the, the sparse graph on the left that shows the current scenario. And on the right, we will have more information after the augmentation. So this what it could mean for any repository. The repositories can use the same technology to basically connect information together. One thing I wanted to mention here, I put the slides from the Research Data Alliance, I think is very much uh, relate to this forum and this conversation. Uh, publication and open access is one thing. Data and open access is the other thing. So as much as we want publications to be cited and accessible and uh, to be in a public domain, Data is the other one that fosters collaboration. So there is actually, in, in many ways, data is more expensive to create. And there's a lot of interest in the international community to make a data, research data is actually open. There is a platform that's called Research Data Alliance, and the data that I use for those analytics come from this community. And this is basically our big funders that they say, well, we all spend money on the data infrastructures. Let's actually work together to make the data open. And when, uh, to a lot of degrees, I think we are following the same pattern of open access publications that will drum on the publishers when it gets to the research data. Now, some of this goes behind the firewall, some of this goes behind the paywall, so there's a whole discussion in that space. So to summarize this, uh, so in the case of APO, that technology uh, of graph connection and augmentation is meant to provide a new and better dis discovery methods. So when we're looking at the article, we can actually find everything else that's linked to it. It also, there is a uh, concept, I think Les, I don't know, if invented that or uh, borrowed from somewhere that's called zero click discovery. <laughs> so if you all land on a page, it actually tells you everything else in that space. Uh, well, let me finish this by just going back to that thing that we have two more, two times more publication with international partners. So that might mean something into this space. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Amir. We're running a little bit over time, but we started a bit late. So we do have a little bit of time for questions. I had some questions for the team, but I'll open it up to the floor and let other people chat. If anyone's got a burning point or question they'd like to raise, any of our speakers. Amanda. Um, yeah, thanks. That was uh, really amazing. I've got a few questions. One question I had. Oh, Something that I have been wondering for a while is how how Wikipedia and and Wikipedia sort of attempts to kind of make all knowledge open connect up with other sorts of databases and systems and um, you know like APO and others. Yeah, I've, I've often wondered where, where, where's where's the connection with all of all of those things and say the institutional repositories yeah. and other systems. So technically. Wikidata provides that platform. I think probably the biggest thing and the excitement just I was thinking then is um, there's, is getting the message out there. That's probably the same for all of us. It's, it's that advocacy and letting people know what's, what's happening. There is a lot of publication um, around about the, the research and the analytics happening in um, Wikidata. But whether it gets into where, uh, you know, into mainstream reading in the library world or where our professional um, space, um, but yes, it, it, 
one thing we don't want is waste anybody's time. And when there's lots of people working in, a sa in the same area, I think we've all got that challenge of making sure people know what's going on so that we can tap into. Um, so generally, so I was looking at uh, with Scolix, you know, that's around publications. Uh, Wikidata definitely is interested in that, but it would also add the layer of all the, um, you know, Australia um, OA and gongs that people have. So it'll have that information in there. It'll have um, any professional association or their academic record that's possibly in ORCID but might not be. So I suppose, you know, at what point do you reach the top where, where is, is that zero click where everything is? <laughs> and um, that relies on connecting up all the, the bits and pieces. But some people won't want the whole thing. If you're only interested in the scholarly bit, you don't, you don't want all the other things that come along with it. That would be one part of it. One thing I can add to this mm. is that the whole thing, if you look, let's assume that we just have a magic wand and we can absorb the entire semantic web from the entire internet. That whole thing is not useful for anything because it's just, it's going to be too complicated, too big. It, it, it just, you can't analyze it. We are actually now seeing the concept of the data packages. So this is kind of like a subset of the bigger data that's actually useful for certain applications. So just having access to too much data sometimes is as bad as having access to no data. Hey, John. Yeah. This is related, it's a question as well, related to yours. Yeah, DBpedia. No, about the link, about this link, you probably know much more about it, about DBpedia, which is, which is the project that has been going on for 10 years now, yeah. linking all databases behind the... Yeah. Um, I'm not 100% and someone else in the room may know more, but um, DBpedia has been around much longer. Um, there are model, there's modelling and things within Wikidata that are um, different and the two are continuing on. There's obviously again connections and but being open anyone can go in whichever direction they want and I'm assuming that both are serving particular purposes. Does anyone else have more on that? I could certainly, you know, uh, have, have another look around about, you know, what what that rationale is. Sorry, Nick, you lost your mind. Just very short, they don't like diet. <laughs> uh, no, it's just that we got the problem of licenses. Because 40% of uh, links coming from the Wikipedia do not have licenses. So they have lots of problems coming from uh, how is it regulated, you know? So we, we started working on that uh, several years ago, and it's going on, so this is something that it's going on. But they didn't know that it were separate tracks, so I would assume that Wikimedia would be much more connected to the Wikipedia as well. And definitely um, there's been a big debate because the, the uh, Wikipedia is licensed as um, attribution share alike by default, um, the Wikidata is um, zero license because it's just too difficult to at, uh, give it attribution. I've got a question and I'm going to really annoy the panel here because I'm going a bit off piste and it's not what I flagged with them earlier, <laughs> so my apologies. But um, we've heard a lot about today about open access versus closed, etc. But I'm just wondering. Uh, obviously, user groups, aren't, they're not singular. There's lots of different kinds of user groups. So I didn't know if there's anything that any of you could add, and I don't expect you to solve it, but just maybe to identify it. Moving forward, what are some of the key ethical challenges around negotiating different user needs around information and, um, or information? I was thinking, Amir, when you were going through the different graphs, some of you might have followed that we failed to uh, merge with our partner at the University of Adelaide, or our partner at Adelaide Institutions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the large part of this, um, when the Vice Chancellor spoke to us on Monday, it was a bit sort of a sense of game on, we're the international uni, we're going to go proudly alone. But I can just see that kind of graph uh, showing where we're, whether we actually are linked internationally or not. It's a kind of metric that's going to be used in a very contentious mm -hmm. moving forward for all universities in Australia. So I'm just interested, there was just one way of looking at it personally as an academic, but Information is a very complex environment. So I just didn't know if any comment upon 
those ethical challenges in your particular spaces? Yeah, well, <laughs> um, well uh, I, I mean, this is, as you know, a, a, an area of, of, of huge debate, and uh, the, I, I, I think the, 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 the ethics are contextual and, and variable, uh, and this is, you know, one of the, the real complexities, because I think what we're really looking for are systems that can be sensitive to, to those things that circumstances will change, uh, that, um, that how you use data and, or, or other information, for that matter, and where you use it will always uh, have significant implications, uh, ethical and, and, and otherwise. And I think this is why I'm interested in the emergence of what we can think of as more dynamic tools for managing these sorts of issues and the you know the blockchain examples can be like that but there are others as well so it's interesting to look for example at um, these systems say in the context of research where we're asking people for permission to for their consent to use personal information one sort or another uh, you know or, or um, or, or uh, genetic information, for example. Um, and our model has been to ask that question, get an answer, and then act upon that, as if that doesn't change, couldn't change, wouldn't be different in different places. So, you know, we um, there's a, you know, very... Um, successful uh, research group at, at, at Melbourne University which has been developing this idea of, of dynamic and consensual systems for uh, managing um, consent uh, for the uses of data uh, and uh, you know in, in say in, in particularly uh, sensitive circumstances for example in relation to you know the DNA of um, indigenous Australians in, in remote Australia um, so, so these, I, I think this is the way we need to go with it. It does introduce complexity. I don't think it necessarily means that we, we can't do, you know, ethical things with the, with the data. Now I'm getting a hurry on here. Would you like to add any feature? Um, our main ones are around copyright. So, you know, if you look at the big um, vision, all people, you know, copyright gets in the way all the time. Wikimedia has a very strong stance of, you know, we will not break um, copyright knowingly and spend a lot of time around that. Um, but, you know, when that gets in the way of, of your ultimate um, goal, you know, is you know, how much could you justify? The other big one is accepting donations. So, you know, and we put um, all the data out there for other people to reuse. What if the people that are reusing it are just making more and more money out of our not out of our volunteers? So you know they're the kind of debates that happen. No answers, but. <laughs> well, uh, I want to go back to the issue of publishers and that point about the licensing. So uh, when we when we are looking at this kind of work or basically overall uh, supporting the research collaboration. There are the concept of uh, open access articles, because everyone knows about that. And I also mentioned about the open data. So that's the one that now we're gearing up toward this. There's one other kind of magical piece here, and that is actually metadata. So a lot of this information comes from metadata. And there is actually historically, there is a practice of not assigning license to metadata. Partially because it's been considered that it doesn't have any value, other part was maybe because it was complicated, created by machines. But the reality is that now that we go through these processes, uh, now, the, now the metadata is quite important. But that is an enabler for a lot of analytics uh, in the space. And uh, there's a very little work has been done in this area. So there's a lot of opportunities for new activities, projects, and research in this space to see how the metadata has to be licensed and how it needs to be available. Thank you very much. Now we're about to roll into our next session straight away, but first would you please join me in thanking our three speakers.